So let's take a moment and we're gonna be going into our next steps with hydraulic fluid. Let me know if you guys can or cannot hear the sound here. All right. So this is a high, this is a watertight door. All right. This is on the Royal Car uh, Caribbean. So this is what's called like a watertight door test. They are going to be utilizing this usually when they install a new watertight door in shipyards. This is what this looks like to me. Um, and then as engineers, you're going to be doing this basically on a monthly basis. You're going to go through, you're going to inspect them. You're going to look at them and make sure there's no hydraulic leaks. There's going to make sure if there is leaks, they're either going to be taken care of, the parts are going to be ordered. <clears throat> the other aspect is, is that you're going to want to have, um, you know, look at the hydraulic tanks. You're going to have separate hydraulic tanks for each one of these watertight doors. All right. So you're going to double check that there's enough hydraulic oil in there that the, it opens and closes as need be. If anything, uh, usually the deck department will worry about the ceiling. So they'll do the chalk test. And basically the chalk test is putting a line of chalk onto the system where you're going all the way around the door on the edge and you're going to see where it, make, uh, it makes contact. Now, the other thing that you're going to be doing is ensuring that the hand pump works. So you're going to open and close the door mechanically. The other aspect you're going to do is open and close the door with a hand pump, which is basically this little bar that you're going to stick onto and you just open and close the door via that. Uh, and then you're also going to check that the other locations, such as the one that has one deck above, that location will open and close it. And then the other one <clears throat> is the uh, from the bridge. So a lot of things to look out for with a watertight door. They tend to move relatively slow. So here's just one example of it. You can actually see on this one, it has uh, almost a double hydraulic piston. So there's a piston down here. Can you guys see my mouse or no? Okay, good. So there's a piston down here and there's another hydraulic piston up here. All right, and then the rest of this is basically, um, it's just basically steel that's gonna be, it rolls on, it's gonna keep the door sealed up along with um, these gaskets that are along the edges right here. But the big thing is, is that those are, two hydraulic cylinders that are gonna be putting the pressure down that's gonna close these doors. And the big thing you notice right at the end there, he had the door handle and he closed it. So it's not like one of those things where you can just keep holding that down and you're not gonna keep that door. It's not gonna break through the wall here. It's just gonna stop, it's gonna get squeezed. And after it's basically together, let go of the handle, it's gonna be fine. It's not gonna have an issue where it's just gonna keep forcing, forcing, forcing and then you have a bend in this wall, all right? So basically just release the handle after it's done and you make sure it's tight, all right? And that's the whole system of going through those. Now, we all know why they're there. Basically it's to keep it and you're trying to keep bulkheads where you have your water type bulkheads, all right? So. These doors, depending on the ship that you're on, you can have watertight doors that are gonna be, while you're underway, always have to be closed. And unfortunately on the engine side, uh, we have to go everywhere on board the vessel, especially in engine rooms. You might have multiple watertight doors that you're gonna have to go through. So you're gonna get good at walking through them. You can see with this kid that he just walked through, you may have to walk the entire length of this tunnel at all times, all right? It all depends on what ship you go on to. Some of them will require these doors to be open and always, sometimes they won't. And you can watch how he's going through. Basically this could be his round where he goes through, he goes all the way down to the end and goes down to the shaft and on his way back, he closes all the doors, all right? See, he's keeping all of his body parts out. There's a safety measures that you wanna make sure you just be aware of. You don't want to get an arm stuck in there. All right. Now, let's see. I find a good one. Uh, 
that's it. So that's it on watertight doors really quickly there. And let's go into our PowerPoint for the day. All right. So, share your screen and share that. All right, so we have shipboard hydraulic systems. This isn't gonna to be too long of a uh, lesson today as far as with hydraulics is concerned, but we're just gonna go over watertight doors and then also basically cranes, everything like that. All right, so these are constant flow systems. We have a gear or screw type positive displacement pump, motor or hand driven delivers constant gallons per minute. All right, so this is what sounds like when you are, if you've ever been at a construction site where you hear um, big cats that are working where you hear those constant hydraulic pumps running and then as soon as they start moving, either bringing the bucket up or down, it, it sounds like more of a nicer flow is going on. That's because the, basically the hydraulic pump is just constantly running at that point, all right? So resistance to moving, movement determines pressure developed and examples are watertight doors and hydraulically operated hatch covers. So this is a constant flow system, all right? What you have here, all along these spots are what? What do you think those are that I just circled on the PowerPoint? Unmute yourself. Say again? Open checks. Valves or checks? They're check valves, yep. So it keeps the direction flow in the way it's supposed to be gone? Yeah, only what allows flow in one direction, all right? So basically what we have here is a control that's going to be on or off, and it's going to allow flow in one direction or the other, all right? So and then we over here, we have basically our hydraulic piston, all right? So it's going to have – this is the piston, these sidewalls are the cylinders, and it's either going to go in one way or the other. All right. And the slides will be up at the end of class today, basically. I have another class right after this. We're gonna get through this and then it's gonna go up right after that. All right. So this is the closed direction. So you're basically gonna be pushing a button or a lever and you're gonna have the closed flow. Flow is only gonna be allowed in one direction here. So it's gonna be going through, get my pen back. So flow is gonna follow this way, all right? And here's the big thing. We have a return valve, and if you notice, it's slid in this direction, all right? As long as it's putting pressure all in these lines here. So it's all in here. It's getting blocked by this return valve. So pressure is going all through that. This is what's called a counterbalance valve. So this is allowing flow. So basically what's happening right now is you have high pressure over here. All right, there's high pressure hydraulic oil. It's pushing down on this, I should use something other than red. It's pushing down on your piston right there. Now you need all of this to go somewhere else. But we're being blocked right now by that one-way valve, all right? That check valve. So that's where you have this counterbalance valve. It's allowing flow, all right? So the flow goes through it, 
and we're basically coming back through into our pump. So right here, we open up and we're basically having flow that's coming around. It gets blocked. This pushed the counterbalance valve. And now we're just coming along here. All nice and neat light there. All right. That's basically how you have to look at with these tracings. All right. Follow the pump and move your way through the system. All right. Now, what happens when we go to the other side? Now our watertight door, let's say it's all the way closed right now. All right, this is the closed side. So now we go and we're doing the open, all right? So pressure is developing on this way. We are blocked here, but we're allowing flow in this direction. All right, it pressurizes the line. It pushes our counterbalance flow over here. All right, it allows flow in this direction, pushes up. This way has to relieve the pressure. So it comes through here. It still can't go in this direction because of the high pressure and it goes back out. So pressure compensated pump maintains system pressure at varying flow rates. Often found in systems where multiple BN devices are actuated in various combinations powered by a single AN device. Examples are backhoes and ships hydraulic cranes. So what we have right here is what those shuttle valves that we were talking about earlier. They're gonna move in one direction or the other, depending if you have like a joystick that's gonna be saying one way or the other, it's gonna drive your shuttle valve in each direction. And when the joystick comes back to neutral, it's gonna to go to the neutral position where we have a no flow. Nothing is gonna be driving these swing motors back and forth of the telescope cylinder. All right. So you're basically having just the constant flow, always ready, but as soon as you let go, as soon as you have that joystick that you're sitting there and you let go of it, it snaps back to center, and now you're no longer having to have flow to it. But as soon as you're ready, it's very obvious that it's going to be, as soon as you're ready to actually swing that joystick and bring it one way or the other, you're going to have flow and it's going to have pressure ready to go and you're gonna be able to do what you need to do either with the watertight door, with the anchor windlass, or any of these crane or winch motor positions that we're talking about here. And again, it's just reversing the flow is gonna be driving one of these motors, something along the lines where you're gonna be using the telescoping cylinder, so you're gonna be pushing on a cylinder, or with the winch motor, He'll actually be driving a motor, which is gonna be hydraulically powered, not electrically. And then here's the left cylinder, which is just basically going up and down with a crane. So a demand type system is a flow rate determined by the operator or control system command signal. All right, resistance to movement determines pressure developed. Often utilizes axial or radial piston variable stroke as an AN device. Examples are steering gear and anchor windlass. Now, these systems are gonna be very based on the fact of, like we talked about, with steering gear. How much you, how fast you turn, how much you, how much you go over is gonna vary on how fast or how quick you're gonna move your steering gear system. All right, the flow rate is determined by the tilt box position. 
pressure determined is focused on rudder, speed, draft, sea state, etc. All right. Now, with an anchor windlass, this is where it gets interesting. So down here, you have a tilt plate. All right. And this is those variable speed motors, the same one, the same one you see on our steering gear system. Now over here is the exact same motor, but the tilt plate is gonna be stationary. All right, it's one directional. And you're gonna control which way the steering, basically not the steering, the anchor windlass goes by this tilt plate. All right, because remember with our axial driven pumps, they're split down the middle. You can have flow going in or out one way or the other. And in doing so, if you just change your tilt plate, say it's on this side, this side could be with your high pressure, and then this side could be your suction. And then you can just change the, and reverse the flow by changing your tilt plate. So you have a constant speed motor driving your axial piston pump. All right, as a fixed tilt and it's a hydraulic motor. You have the electric brake and then you have your two Gibson, Gibson heads. All right, so you change your tilt plate position using your joystick control right here. You're gonna have high pressure come on this side. All right. Comes in, it's going to spin your, actual, your axial here. All right. And the same thing if you go in the reverse way. It's gonna reverse, it's gonna reverse the flow. Now, this is just a little animation of basically that whole system going into play. So this is our driven end. So this is connected via a motor. All right. Pump rotating at a rated speed and the tilt box is at zero stroke. No fluid is pumping to the motor and the motor is not rotating. All right, so we are at a constant speed right now with no fluid moving through. But as soon as we change that and we have an actual tilt on our tilt plate, we will start to have flow, all right? Just like what we did with our steering gear system. The pump is rotating at a rated speed. The tilt box is at maximum stroke, matching the, fill, uh, the fixed tilt plate or motor. The fluid pulled to A end, near side, delivered to the B end, far side. The motor rotates at the pump speed in the same direction. All right, remember, even though we're looking at this in a 2D right now, we have our near side here and our far side over here. All right, oops. <laughs> Let's try that again. So you have your near side and far side, all right? So fluid pulled to the A end, near side, is delivered to the B end, far side. The motor rotates at pump speed in the same direction. Now, if we go for less of a tilt, we're gonna develop half the speed, all right? So when you have your actual joystick and you're controlling how fast or how 
slow you're going. You're actually physically controlling the tilt plate in your drive end. All right. So if the pump is rotating at half rated speed, the tilt box at half stroke delivers half the volume to the motor per revolution. The motor rotates in the same direction as the pump, but at half the speed. Now remember, this tilt plate over here is fixed. All right, so that's why that looks off. So the pump rotating at rated speed, the tilt box at maximum stroke and the opposite to the tilt of the motor. Fluid delivered to the B end, the near side, pulled to A end, far side. Motor rotates at pump speed in the opposite direction. All right, remember one is gonna be rotating and it's gonna be pushing fluid. All right, and it only has one place to go. That's why, that's what makes this whole system over here work. All right, it's gonna be forcing the cylinders to move. So let's take a quick look. Anybody need any of that reviewed again before I feel like we're going to go into, and we're just going to review some other things that we need to get done again. I just have a question. Go for it. So like we got a forklift and so you can, you can lower the, the, uh, the forks after the forklift is off. Why is that? So a lot of hydraulic systems have a reservoir and you can use that pressure after a machine's been shut off in an emergency or to start the motor depending on the system. I asked the same question a couple of years ago when I was working with a bull up in Ketchikan, but most okay. have a small reservoir for backup pressure. All right, thanks. All right, anybody else? I kind of have a question actually. Okay. Um, why do we use hydraulic systems for windlasses and that two pump system? I, why not just connect a motor? If you, because there's still gonna be feedback through the hydraulic system, what, why would you arrange it like that? My guess is that you could be basically You'd be in a spot where you can overcome by just natural forces with ships moving. And basically you can reverse spin it if it was just directly attached to a motor or anything like that, where the electric forces aren't going to be able to keep the motor locked and spinning in the, the actual direction that you want it to be in. Whereas with hydraulic oil, it would actually be locked in place. All right. Has anybody, guys who are in my deck department, have you guys actually seen, go to Firefox, an anchor windlass catch fire? I've seen videos of it, but other than that, not really. Okay. Well, yeah, hopefully you've just seen videos. That's not something you want to be going out and seeing. All right, so here's an anchor windlass failing. Today's video is doesn't go well during sea trials of a new merchant vessel in Germany. The brake on the anchor winch failed to properly function. Number 
All right, here we go. Number four, a U.S. Navy ship conducts an anchor drop test during sea trials. Things get a little dangerous. Number three, the USS Tarawa dropped anchor at sea. So these are what the brake actually found. And they actually lose the anchor here, as what we saw earlier. It just flies off of the vessel. And it's gone. I don't know why that's staying up there, though. New York homeowners, all the electric companies are raising their rates, but you can stop them. By getting solar panels installed at no cost to you, you'll get your power. Oh. So this is the more famous one of the actual failing. This one actually physically catches fire. idea is, is you don't want to let these things go out too fast because if it starts to gain momentum you're not stopping it you just got to run because imagine this the entire ship is going to be pulled on this thing And it's gone. They have no more anchor chain. It's now at the bottom of the ocean. To a tugboat. So. Basically, there's some anchor chain failures that you can actually be aware of what would happen. Um, I've only seen them in video. I hope you guys only see them in video. Now, let's see.
let's go into Oh, professor. What's going on? So every lecture, we're going to have a quiz, right? Yes. Right. So it's going to be on last lecture. So we're going to have basically this one coming up is going to be too much because it wasn't that much of a lecture. It was hydraulics three. All right. So it's not going to be a huge amount of information that's going to be on this one. Um, so on Monday, we're going to have a quiz on this lecture as well, right? Let me just look at it real quick because I haven't made it yet. No, let's have a quiz on. No, there's going to be no quiz on Monday. All right. Real important stuff was basically hydraulics one and two. So let's go over real quick. Oops. All right. One more time with distilling plants because we were all not getting this on the last test. So with distilling plants, fresh water generation. All right. We have basically we have our evaporator and we have our condenser. All right. Now remember, when we go through with distilling plants, everything we do before it goes into our evaporator is to increase our efficiency, all right? Right now, we can take our feed pump and we could take 75 or 55 degree water, seawater, which is usually what it's at, and it can go right into here, produce a vapor that's sitting at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we're gonna have to go all the way back down to get a distillate that would probably be sitting in somewhere <clears throat> in the high 150s. All right, that's extremely inefficient because this distillate is gonna be sitting right on the sidewall of your ship, right next to 55 degrees seawater. All right, and doing so, you're gonna basically be in a spot where you're gonna cool it down anyway. You might as well utilize the feed you're gonna be putting into your evaporator to actually heat up and preheat your water before it goes into it. So again, anything that's considered high pressure is a, basically anything under pressure, evaporation under a pressure. And what our reference point is one atmosphere. This is what we're sitting in right now, all right? One atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSIA, which is equal to zero PSIG, all right? And then we have what our boiling points are at, all right? Everything below that is under a vacuum, all right? So this is when we actually talk about inches of mercury, all right? Or commonly referred to as just inches. So here's our high pressure EVAP example that we get through pretty too quickly. So what is happening here is we have under a high pressure, all right? We have our feed pump, we have our contaminated drain inspection tank, we have our drain cooler. So all we're doing here is we have 40 PSI vapor 
that's sitting at 285 degrees Fahrenheit. It's operated off of a float switch, all right? So just like your toilet bowl at home, if you lift off the toilet bowl, that's a float switch in there, all right? So that will turn on and off your feed pump and it'll either add, it'll basically add water from your contaminated drain tank into your contaminated evaporator. It's heated by 150, uh, 150 PSI auxiliary steam, all right? So your hot, high pressure steam goes into all of these systems, all right? It's contaminated. We don't want to use this water we don't want to use this steam for anything other than these systems, all right? Because if you have a leak in any of these systems and you're not heating your fuel oil, if you're not heating your lube oil, you're not using your gallery steam at that moment, all right? That could all leak into your steam system. And then when you go to use your fuel oil heating, you now have fuel oil in your coils and it all goes into your drain cooler, goes into your contaminated drain tank, and that's why you have this at atmosphere. So you can pee, basically lift open the hatch and take a look into it and see if there's any oil in it, and you'll know there's a leak in here. You don't want that in your boiler. All right, low pressure evap. So the big question on the test is, is that submerged tube type evaporator. All right, what's the main difference between a submerged tube type and a flash evap, all right? And obviously the answer is, is that one has a tube's nest and the other doesn't. But, I'm gonna sneeze. Um, the other aspect is, is what your feed water is going in at. All right, you have feed water at 130 degrees. And that's coming in basically through your entire system. So your steam comes through here, it gets preheated. I mean, it comes out and it goes through and it's preheating your distillate, all right? So all of your feed pump, all of the water that's coming out of here gets heated up all the way in and reaches 130 degrees. Now you go into the flash type Here's the big difference between the two. Look at that temperature difference going in here. It went from 130 to 172. Also, all of your feed water is now going into the system. All right, that's the big difference that we have to look at. It's not just that we don't have a tube's nest. That's the obvious answer. But knowing that 130 degrees at three PSIA is not gonna be the boiling point. It's pretty damn close and that's why you still use a tube's nest to heat it up. But when we go to our flash type evaporator and we preheat, so all of our water going into is at 172 degrees and as soon as it enters, it's gonna be flashing into steam. So like we talked about on Monday, and we were talking about normally open, normally closed. Here's a perfect example, coming off of a salinity cell. All right, this is a three-way valve, but you can also have, is basically a tree. All right, where you have two solenoid valves here, and this is your salinity cell. All right, this one goes to the bilge, and that one is gonna to go to your tanks. And this is where you would wanna have a normally open or normally closed system, all right? Whereas with here, and you're going to your bilge, this one you would want normally open, all right? You lose electrical 
you don't want to salt your distillate tanks. So you would want all your flow to go this way. So it would be normally open when no electricity is there. All right, and this would be a normally closed. So you lose electricity, this valve will shut and all of your flow will go to your bilge. All right, think how little water this salinity cell is gonna let in. Look how, remember what it is. It's under three ppm of salt. If we send any water that's above three ppm into these tanks, you can have really direct, like really bad effect of what's happening. It could just not destroy the tank, but you would have to empty the entire tank and flush it multiple times before you would get to a point where you could put and use distilled water out of it. All right. So when we are utilizing our feed pump, goes to our distillate cooler. So we're preheating it. All right. Like we said, going in at 88 degrees. I'm sorry. The distillate's going in at 126 degrees. It's coming out at 90 degrees. We are preheating our feed to 88 degrees. Just in this one example of where it started out at. Does anybody have any questions on today's lesson or anything else that we reviewed really quickly before the day is over? Uh, so that quiz that's coming up on Wednesday, are we gonna go back to uh, freshwater plants and put some of that stuff on there or? No, so there's no, so there's no quiz on Monday, okay? Right, the one that's, I'm assuming it's gonna be the class after that then yeah so it's not going to go back to any of this this was just a quick review of what was happening and what i was seeing with everything okay all right um so monday's class is going to be electrical one all right the other thing is is that so that means wednesday's quiz is going to be on electrical one all right um let's see So the quiz average is just like one big test grade, right? Yes. So right now we're going to be sitting at, let me pull up a calendar. No quiz Monday. We'll have a quiz Wednesday. So we're going to definitely have a quiz on each electricity. So that's three quizzes there. And then we have steam. All right. And then steam is probably going to be two lessons. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five. So six total quizzes probably. Oh, that's not bad. All right. So grading how it's going to be, as I sent out in the email. All right. We have um, test one, two, and three. Each one is 15%. So like if you mess up on one quiz, it's not going to like really affect your GPA if you like pass like all three of your tests, right? I mean, it's good. let's, I'll show you everything in a second. So you have test one, two, and three. All right. And each one of these is at 15% each. All right. And then you have participation. And that's going to be 10%. And then you have your quiz average. And that's going to be 15%. So that's going to be the average of all of your quizzes together. All right. And then you have your final. And that's going to be 30%. All right. And that all adds up to basically 100%. Well, so the final is like two tests. Basically. Right. So, 
That's the way we're breaking down everything. You're going to have basically six quizzes. All right. How did the, would you guys rather, let's do this in the poll because I can. Hmm. Can you guys see the poll? No. Where is it? Is there a poll that popped up on the bottom or no? No. Uh, no. no. All right. Well, I'm thinking I see. I'm still playing around with this as it goes through. Basically, would you guys rather have one question at a time or all the questions for your quizzes at the same time? All the questions. All the questions. So like we, all questions. we backtrack is what you're saying? Yeah, all the questions like, sound good. Sure. So right now I have it set up so that way. Because like if it's one question at a time, then and I want to go back to my old question because I yeah. probably fucked it up. It's going to fuck, you know. <laughs> I agree. All right. So uh, I'll change that to the next one. All right. Anybody have any other questions? Or if they, I have class at 1130. So all the quizzes are going to be 10 questions? Yeah, about 10 questions. And make sure you study which ones you got wrong and which one you got right, all right? Because a lot of them are going to show up again on your test. Not all of them, and maybe not in the same exact, but a lot of them will show up. Um, for that participation grade, what's exactly like, um, like in it? I go to part of it. Big part of it's going to be, you know, how are you, how are you in the class? You know, is it very obvious that you're sitting there, you're playing video games, or are you watching movies on the side? Um, you know, things like that. Are you attentive in the class? That's what we're looking for. All right. So if it's there, it's basically, it's only there to help you. And if you hurt yourself, it's basically, it's going to hurt you again. All right. Now, one thing I want to make per perfect, like absolutely clear to you guys, if you have internet cap like connectivity problems, all right, where someone in this class today, basically like the internet power went out on them. It happened to me randomly when I was in a Zoom meeting with my entire the engineering department on Thursday, this past Thursday. It happens to all of us. Email me, take a picture of what happens. Everybody can show Everybody has a camera on their app that basically, let's see, where is it? Show all windows. Everyone has the ability to, to show what is actually happening on their screen. All right, take your smartphone out, just take a, a quick photo of the fact that you can't connect. All right, and we'll work something out. I'm not a robot. I'm not going to destroy you guys just because your internet cut out on you. All right, so as long as it's happening and it's not your fault, document it and don't freak out and just email me. All right. Wait, Professor, if my Wi Fi had just kind of went out for like five minutes during class, but then I joined back in, would I be like uh, penalized for that or no? No. Okay, thank you. 
It's all about a, attempting to get in here, guys. That's the biggest thing is that we're just looking for the effort that you're going to be in this. All right, so attendance is going to be taken care of. Have the attendance records. It Basically, Zoom takes attendance. So that's why we're utilizing it. So you're here. It shows up. You guys have your attendance record there. All right. I was ended up um, sitting in the office hours by mistake, and then I got here. Yeah, make sure you guys choose which one is the right one. All right. Um, as people who came in late, as you'll see, I actually admitted you, it pops up, it makes noise on my computer. I made that so it happens. Now, the other aspect is, is that you can actually show up. If you go to the Zoom, now if you go to Zoom, which it's going to, do that to me, of course. All right, let me see if I can pull it up quickly, guys. I'm not going to keep you if you don't want to. If you don't want to be here, but if you want to hear the information, that's fine by me. So. If you go in here. There's mobile numbers, all right? So right here is a number that you can call and that will connect you into, this is for the office hours, but you can do it the same as for our lessons. All right, so if your internet cuts out, you could still call in and do that as well, all right? And then just type in the comments if you, um, well, you won't be able to because it's a phone call, but then email me saying that you're back in just basically with the phone number. So that way it'll count you for your attendance. All right. So that's a way to get around it as well. Now I am posting these to YouTube. Um, hope everyone's able to get to the YouTube channel with no problem. Um, any other issues that you guys are seeing? Oh, what's your YouTube channel? It's up on Blackboard. All right. Oh, where exactly? Uh, if you literally the first page you go up to, it's right here on announcements. It says YouTube channel. You click that link. Oh, I see it. And then, and there are the lectures. So if you want to listen to the other lecture, there might be questions that got brought up in that lecture that wasn't in your lecture. So it's how you want to study with it. All right. Um, let's see. There's Ugly's reference. Unfortunately, it looks like Amazon is not shipping with two-day shipping anymore with everything so i i ordered mine and i got it in two days you got it in two days yeah. they're basically for me they're affecting it's i'm not able to to get anything until like next month is there like an electrical version yeah of the the book, uglies, like, or, say again is there like a pdf or something for the uglies or it's just like a hard copy there's a kindle version so it's 15 for that um so there's a PDF version. You might be able to even go onto their website. But it is a good book. Like I said, the, the way I found it was by being at, um, being on ships and literally being like, Oh, what's this book in the control room and just picking it up and reading it because you're there for 12 hours and you get bored. All right. Um, any other questions about how to navigate Zoom or anything else? Is is everyone's internet holding up all right, or is anybody having real issues? Mine's giving me issues a lot, but for the most part, I can stay connected. Okay. Uh, the big thing I can tell everybody who's still in this is that, one, if you can limit – if people can try and, like, if you have uh, family members in the house – Ask them when you're in class or before you have big tests. Netflix and Hulu put a huge strain on it. If everyone else is just doing their work and they're also team streaming, that's also a big issue um, that you just can't control. If you can, if you can try and get on an Ethernet cable and connect directly into your router, it should solve a huge amount of the issues. Um, and then there also is some things that you can do to your router, some settings you can change that will also increase your internet speed, connectivity 
other such things. If you're in an apartment, there's something called your channel that you can be messing with. I'll post that to Blackboard. Go ahead and mess around with them. I suggest doing it on the weekend so that way you, it doesn't affect you if you have to go into class. All right, but there's two things that I've done to my router that has helped a lot um, that you guys might want to fiddle around with that could help out. And I could post those to uh, Blackboard. All right, anybody else have any issues that went along, you know, or go into a private call, it's fine. Um, for the participation grade, do you want the video on, like, so you can see me through the webcam, or, like, is that okay if I have it off? I I would like to see you guys on the, the webcam. It, it helps me with the teaching. If you see that I'm staring off onto the side, just because I have two monitors, and I'm literally teaching on one, and then over here is where all you guys are at. All right. So that way I can stare at you guys. It just helps me with the fact that I want to be able to see you guys and still be face to face and teach you. All right. Good. All right. All good. Yep. Uh, uh, professor, what's going on? I'm taking the makeup exam later. Um, is it going to be on Blackboard like the quiz? No, we'll talk in the, uh, we'll, We'll make a private call and we'll go over what we're gonna do for that, okay? Okay. And then, all right, so that's it for me guys that I have as far as information for you. Um, like I said, keep looking at the emails. That's the other thing, if you guys have, need me with a specific issue, um, the way Outlook works, don't, just press reply to the mass emails that I send out. All right, start a new email because otherwise it just gets buried. It's just the way the email systems work, okay? So if it's something important, type in, you know, do new email and then type in my name and then go from there. That'd be a lot easier on all of us because then I can actually see them and it'll become a new chain, all right? Everyone good? Yep. All right, if you have any questions, you can stick around, otherwise, I will see you guys.